As soon as I touch the two high voltage wires together, it creates lightning on here, this little blue spark. And that lightning triggers the antenna, and it triggers my whole lightning detector circuit. Tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner, tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. In the place that I live, it almost never rains. We get like six rainstorms a year. But tomorrow, it looks like we're going to have a very big rainstorm. And I'd like to see how many times lightning strikes during this rainstorm. And I know it's winter, so it may not strike as many times because lightning typically strikes more during summer storms. But I'm going to try and build a lightning detector and see if we can figure out how many times it's going to strike. So let's get started. So this is the schematic that we're going to be using inside this video. Now I must admit that I didn't actually create this schematic. Uh, I found it in a blog post by some guy named Wenzel, and uh, I'll put a link to his website in the description. But let me explain to you how this circuit works, and how lightning works. Alright, so whenever lightning strikes the ground, it creates tons of different radio frequencies. It creates frequencies all across the spectrum, but most importantly, it creates a lot of stronger radio waves uh, along the frequency of about 400 kilohertz. Now, it produces all these uh, low frequency um, electromagnetic waves as soon as it strikes the ground. Now, there are almost no other radio bands in this frequency, and so it's useful because the only time there's ever spikes on this frequency is when lightning strikes. And so the basic purpose of the circuit is an AM radio that can detect frequencies around 400 kilohertz. Now the circuit doesn't really need to be precisely tuned because this lightning bolt throws across um, frequencies all across the spectrum. So let's take a look at this circuit and how it's going to function. And so right now you can see that we have an antenna and then we have a capacitor and two inductors and that is basically the tank coil and this 11 Henry inductor, when you combine these two, plus a 10 picofarad capacitor, will um, make a resonant frequency of about 400 kilohertz or somewhere around there. I haven't checked the calculations. This 270K resistor is basically just to dampen out the oscillations to slightly desensitize this thing. All right, so the signal from this tapped tuned circuit is going to go through this resistor and into this first NPN transistor. This NPN transistor is biased to the gate. Now basically what's going to happen is the signal is going to go inside the transistor and fluctuate like that. Now depending on the voltage of the base of this transistor is going to vary the voltage of the output right here because as it goes down to ground then it lowers the voltage uh, through this 10k resistor because there's going to be a current going across it through the transistor. Now the DC offset on the variable voltage of this pin is going to be taken out by this 120 picofarad capacitor and then fed into these uh, other transistors. All right, so now we've established that we have an AC voltage on this pin right here. Now this circuit right here is basically to give a uniform pulse of a few milliseconds whenever there's lightning. So what's gonna happen is when this circuit is running normally, this point is going to be at a 5 volt through this bias resistor right here. Now when this point is at that 5 volt bias voltage, it's going to charge this capacitor through this diode, and this capacitor is basically going to ch stay charged. Now when we have an AC voltage on this pin, it's going to activate this transistor right here. And now this is where the fun happens. As soon as this PNP transistor is on, it's going to stay on for as long as this capacitor is charged. Now the reason because of that is because it is going to draw current through this resistor, through the diode, through this transistor, and into this NPN transistor right here into ground, and that's going to turn on this transistor. Now when this transistor is turned on, it's going to bring this point to a virtual ground, and that's also going to give us one of these ground pulses right here, because typically it's on, whenever it turns off, it's going to give it a ground pulse like that. Alright, so now what happens is this points at ground, now this capacitor is not going to discharge because there's a diode there, but both of these transistors are going to stay on. Now the reason behind that is because there's an 82k resistor right here, and because this point is at a virtual ground, that's going to ground bias this transistor, and because it's a PNP transistor, that means it's going to stay on. And when it's on right now, 
it's going to be draining this capacitor through this transistor and through the 3.9k resistor into this NPN transistor to ground, and that's going to keep the circuit locked basically until the voltage of this capacitor right here drops below the on voltage of this transistor right here. As soon as it drops below the on voltage of this transistor, this transistor is going to turn off, this point's going to return to 5 volts, it's going to 5 volt bias this transistor, it's going to turn that transistor off, and the whole circuit will be off, and the pulse pin will again be high to 5 volts until another lightning bolt strikes, and this circuit turns on again for another uniform pulse of low on here. Whew. Wow. That is basically explaining the schematic. So that's the schematic. Hopefully you understood that. Now it's time to build this thing. All right, now the first thing you need for every project are quality components. And I get all my quality components from LCSC components. You can check out their link in the description. But from LCSC, I got everything that I'm going to need from this project. Uh, from the inductors, to the transistors, to the capacitors, to all the resistors, and everything else I'm going to need to make a lightning detector. All right, so I'm going to start by building this thing on a breadboard. So let's understand the basics of how a breadboard works. And so now you see you've got all these lines right here, and everything inside this line is going to be connected by a little conductive wire inside, and everything inside the positive and negative rails are going to be conductive and connected by a positive wire inside. All right, so let's say I have something like a transistor. So let's say I put the transistor in this way. This is not the proper way to put a transistor in a breadboard. This basically makes the transistor useless because all the leads are connected to each other. The proper way is this way, and that means that each of these separate conductive lines are connected to one lead of the transistor. Now I'm not going to make a little explanation for each component that I put inside this breadboard from the circuit, but basically know that inside the circuit diagram, you've got different parts that are connected to each other, and then you just need to connect them. So for now, I'm just going to make a time lapse of me putting this thing together. All right, so this is the finalized circuit, and it looks really good, I think. It's got all the components on it, and right here is a little RF tank circuit built on this breadboard. So this LED right here tells us um, if the circuit is on, and also we have a multimeter right here connected to the output of the circuit uh, to tell if it's giving a 0 or 5 volt output signal. Alright, so now it's time to demonstrate how well this lightning detector actually works with real lightning. And so for my lightning simulator, I'm going to be using this little tiny box, and it's got a flyback transformer and a 555 flyback driver. The light's going to originally pop on for a little bit, then as soon as I touch it so the lightning happens, the light lights up. As soon as I touch the two high voltage wires together, it creates uh, lightning on here, this little blue spark, and that lightning triggers the antenna, and it triggers my whole lightning detector circuit, and you can see that light lighting up right there. Now with this lightning receiver, it's also interesting to see the effect of two different ham radios and what they have on this lightning receiver. And so right here, I have a little handheld radio, and this outputs about 2 watts, maybe a little bit less. And this thing runs at a, the 2 meter band, and that is relatively high frequency. I also have my big 10 meter radio transmitter right here, and this thing runs in the 10 meter radio band. And that is approximately uh, 27 megahertz. And that is actually a lot smaller of a frequency than this high frequency radio transmitter. Now this 10 meter radio transmitter should have a greater effect on the lightning receiver than this small HF radio. CQ, 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 CQ. The light wasn't flashing very strong. Well, now it's time to try out the HF radio and you're gonna see a very big difference. So the HF radio, the antenna is outside the coax is on the coax goes from the radio to the roof where the antenna is but let's try transmitting let me turn the uh, rf power down almost all the way so it's very minimal cq cq this is kilo mic 6 juliet echo yankee as you can see when the rf power was minimal 
even less than the HF radio, the light still was blinking very strongly. So that just shows how tuned the resonant circuit is inside my lightning detector, because it detects the lower frequencies from the, this HF radio instead of the higher frequencies from this 2 meter radio. So as you can see right there above my desk, I have an antenna that goes all the way down to my lightning detector. Now I'm going to leave this whole thing running while I'm at school all day today, and so I'd like to be able to see whatever lightning strikes even when I'm not here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an Arduino uh, Uno, I'm going to take the multimeter out pin, I'm going to insert that into pin 10. So that way we can get a digital input reading of 0 or 5 volts. There we go. And then we can also take the outputs that are going right now to the power supply, and we can actually insert those into our uh, Arduino 2. Alright, so let's insert that SD card, turn on that Variac, and turn off all the lights. Just leave it be. See what happens. Alright, so this is a very simple code that I am using to run the Lightning Data Logger. So in the beginning, it basically initializes all the pins and initializes an SD card shield. And here's where the good stuff happens. So if Lightning is equal to 1, which means that pin 8 is high, and milliseconds is minus difference is greater than 300, which means that 300 milliseconds must have passed since the last time this code is ran and it wrote to the SD card. And basically what, what it will do is it will open the SD card file, it'll write the time to the SD card, and it'll close the file. Alright, so it's about 2 o'clock, and I started this thing running at about 6.30 in the morning. Let's take a look at this SD card and see what we can find on here in terms of if any lightning has struck today. Now I haven't actually heard any lightning strike, but that doesn't mean that no lightning did strike. So it'll be really cool to plug this into my computer and look at the data file and see what we can see. Alright, so this is uh, the final readout from the data logger. And as you can see, there are a lot of data points. Let's take a look at that on a spreadsheet. So something obviously went wrong here because we have 4,775 data points. That is not correct at all. And so let's look at the graph to see what happened. Now in the beginning the graph looks linear and it looks relatively stable. And this is probably because the lightning detector is triggering every half a second or something like that. And then right here something weird happens. The graph gets super big. And this is because it's triggering at longer intervals of time, which is weird because it followed this uh, relatively stable slope for about four and a half hours. But then for the last four hours of the code running, it, it went all crazy. And there's more time intervals between when each uh, lightning strike was recorded. So obviously this code didn't do a good job uh, recording lightning strikes or something else happened because the Arduino is almost constantly recording uh, fake lightning strikes that never happened once every half a second up until this point where something strange happens and I really don't think there were that many lightning uh, strikes today. Now I'm not sure what exactly happened right here when the time intervals got longer uh, between each supposed lightning strike but overall this code just shows that it didn't work as intended. And so I'm not actually sure if it's the code's fault completely. I think that maybe my circuit was running at too high of a voltage level and that was constantly triggering the, the sensor. All right, so that is a slight explanation of the incredibly strange data that I received from this lightning project with my 4,000 data points. So as it stands right now, this lightning detector circuit works perfectly, at least this part does. The Arduino half of it, I'm not so sure. Alright, so how I got that input into the Arduino, is so I basically used this circuit that was down here, but I replaced this lamp with a 10k resistor, and I tapped the point right here, and so when the transistor is off and there's no current flowing, this point should be at ground, and then when the transistor turns on, this point goes to 5 volts, which theoretically should work, but it didn't really work uh, with my purpose, because as you saw in that weird graph that I got, 
This thing almost always kept receiving data and writing data and thinking there was always a lightning bolt striking, even when there wasn't any lightning bolt striking whatsoever. Now in the future, I might take all these components that are right now on this breadboard and integrate them all onto a nice uh, piece of perf board. And then I'll keep working on trying to work out the bugs with this Arduino data logger so that way we can get some real lightning. Now I really don't think I missed out on much in this video because there wasn't much lightning. I did not see a single lightning strike. That doesn't mean there wasn't one, but I didn't see any. So maybe by the time I get this thing working, it'll actually rain again because it almost never rains where I live. So I hope you liked this video about learning how to make a miniature circuit that can detect lightning or any other uh, RF pulse that's around 400 kilohertz. Well, that's it. As always, thanks for watching and stay tuned for my next video.